morning. Uh, John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as, as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have, told, I have told you this so you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one that, than, than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because as a servant does, don't, does not know his mother's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did, no, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Amen. We'll get back to that verse in just a moment. Last week, um, <clears throat> I showed you some photos of a house that I was blessed to help build down near Ensenada. And um, so I also advertised that we'd like to do this again next year. And several of you approached me and said you would like to be part of that. And so what I did was I created a sign-up list. It's back on the back table. If you would like to be part of that, please sign that. Give me your phone number and email if you have one. And, um, and we'll start coordinating on deciding a date and stuff like that when we want to do that. You will be able to sign up later if you would like to be part of that, most likely. However, the group that signs up right now is going to get together and make all the decisions about when and all of that. So if you want to be part of the decision-making group, it would be good to sign up now for that. So that would be a great opportunity. Also last week, I uh, spoke about this theme, Emmanuel, God with us the gift of hope. We're speaking about this theme because of the time of year it is, and particularly because our neighbors are very open to the fact that God came to be with us through his son Jesus, specifically at this time of the year. I don't know if Jesus was actually born during this time of year or not, but I know Jesus came and that he came to be with us, God with us. And since our neighbors are open to that, I thought this was a really great time to bring some lessons that our neighbors would be interested in hearing. And so, especially next week on the 23rd, uh, there are two days a year that lots of people who normally don't go to church go to church, and that would be just before Christmas and just before or on Easter. And so uh, if you have some neighbors, some relatives, feel free to invite them. The message will be the gift of joy next week. Today will be the gift of love. Last week when we talked about the gift of hope, one of the uh, illustrations that I presented to you was a uh, copper gold mine in the country of Chile, northern Chile, where 33 miners were buried for over 60 days. It actually turned out to be 69, 70 days. I think it took them between day 69 and 70 to get them all out. But 33 miners were buried for uh, 69 days until they were finally able to be extracted uh, through some very technological means uh, out of the earth. But they never gave up hope in the camp that was above them a half a mile above them with their family members and neighbors all just camping out for over two months was called Campamento Esperanza, Camp Hope. And we related that to how that many times during the holidays we sort of feel down because our lives are changing. As we progress through life, our physical abilities change uh, the loved ones we used to have holidays with, some of them are not around anymore. And so some people, including myself, many of us tend to have uh, signs of depression or sadness or lack of hope. 
But God sent Jesus. And when God said in the book of Isaiah, we'll not go through that again, but when God told uh, the king in Isaiah, I want to give you hope. I'm going to send a virgin who will have a son. His name will be Emmanuel. What God was telling King Ahaz there was, I'm going to be with you. I am with you. You don't need to go and look to the king of Assyria or other kings for help, even though you're being attacked on all sides. I am with you. And as a sign, uh, I am Emmanuel, God with you. Uh, through a son that would be born. And in Jesus, in Matthew 1, 23, when Joseph was having thoughts too about, should I take this supposed virgin to be my wife? And he was thinking about getting rid of her. God said, no, this was all done by God's plan, the Holy Spirit. This was done to show that God would be with you, Joseph, and with his people, Emmanuel, God with us, to give us hope. And so even though... Even though things are not the same, even though we're buried a half a mile underground, God is even there. He is the God that is with us. Emmanuel also means that God is the gift of love. He is with us and he gives us the gift of love. No other gift is so great as the gift that God gave us uh, in the gift of love when Jesus Christ came and became Emmanuel to us. In Matthew 1, 23, when it says the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, he was really telling us that when Jesus came, and we can look through the life of Jesus and see how Jesus sort of snapshots through his life, how he loves every person and every type of person. Jesus was surrounded by all kinds of people. He was surrounded by religious leaders. He was surrounded by men, by women, people of different ethnicities, people of different backgrounds, intelligent people, not so intelligent, not so studied people, and yet he loved everybody. He loved every type of person. One of the people that I've talked to you about in my life, two of the people actually that I've talked to in, in my life were my aunt or my uncle and aunt, uh, Uncle Glenn, and my Aunt Jan. Uncle Glenn is my dad's brother. My dad is still alive. Uncle, Uncle Glenn passed away a few years ago. Uh, Glenn and Jan uh, were missionaries in Peru from about 1962 to about 1969, more or less in that span, in the 60s. And uh, he, they went to Peru with, I believe they had at that time, seven children. I believe their last child, Stephen, was born in Peru. Uh, but, but basically, they started most of the churches of Christ in Peru at that time. Uh, now, they've multiplied since then, of course. Uh, but, um, but they are, are a highly respected couple in Peru. Uh, when I was a freshman out here at COD, I actually just finished my freshman year, Glenn asked me to go back to Peru. He had come back. Uh, to the states in about 1969 or 70. In 76, he wanted to return, and he asked me to go back with him. And so I said, sure, I'll go with you. But I learned more from my Uncle Glenn about acculturation. Acculturation is becoming like the people you are trying to serve. I learned more from Uncle Glenn on that trip uh, than, than anybody up to that point and probably that I've learned since that point. I learned it with him on that trip. Three months, 1976, in Peru. We traveled the whole country. Uh, one of the things I learned uh, is you adapt yourself to whatever the situation is. Become like the people you are there to serve. We ate whatever people put before us. We made basically three trips throughout the country, one to the north, one to the interior, which is kind of jungle, and one to the south. Uh, and in all of that time, we, we never stayed one night in a hotel. We always, kind of like Jesus sent out the 70, you know, I kind of felt like you got no extra coat, you got no money, and you got no part, where to sleep. Just, just roll with it, you know. And that's kind of the way we traveled. And, and we stayed with brethren, with, we stayed with people who wanted to study the Bible, we stayed just in all sorts of circumstances. I learned just to adapt and acculturate and become like the people uh, that we were trying to serve. Um, there was one place that we stayed 
where for breakfast we had kui. I think I've mentioned this to you before. Uh, and you might wonder, what's kui? If you look it up in your dictionary, your South American dictionary, you'll find out it's guinea pig. And so we, uh, we were served guinea pig for breakfast. And that's probably why some of you don't invite me over. <laughs> you probably have guinea pigs for pets. Uh, but that's what we ate, and, um, and, and that was fine. Acculturation, becoming like the people you serve. Jesus loves every type of person. But to love people, you have to become like them. Love is choosing to meet people where they are to help them draw near to God. And so whatever arrangements they had for us to sleep, that's how we slept, on dirt floors sometimes, on army cots sometimes, just whatever the arrangements were, that's what we adapted to. I believe when Jesus said to be his disciple, take a good look at it because the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I don't think he was speaking so much about poverty. He might have been referring to, you know, I'm not going to have a rich life. But I believe Jesus was really saying more about adaptability and flexibility. If you're going to follow the Son of Man, just be ready to be adaptable and flexible because the Son of Man doesn't know where he's going to lay his head tonight because he loves every type of person. One of the things I love about Jesus and my Uncle Glenn and Jan is the way they have taught me to be adaptable, to acculturate to people, to just love people wherever they're at. A couple other examples I want to give you of acculturation or adaptability and coming near to people. Uh, Nancy and I, as you know, we're, we're blessed to be able to serve and, and work in, in Tijuana, Mexico for a while. Uh, I showed you this picture last week. This was a picture of uh, a couple of weeks ago, the house that the family lived in down in Ensenada, uh, which is a little bit south of, of Tijuana. But uh, we met a lady named Maria in Tijuana early on in our ministry there through some canvassing and door knocking and, and Bible studies and stuff like that, a lady named Maria. And she lived in a house very similar to this one. It was probably a little bigger than that one. Maria's was probably 12 feet square. That one's about 8 or 10 feet square. But when we met Maria, there were 13 people living in her house that was just like that. And the other difference was Maria's house was up on a hillside. So you had to walk up about 50 steps or 60 steps to get up to it. Uh, but I remember hanging out and studying the Bible with Maria and her daughter Antonia and Lupita. And I think uh, the, olders, the older ones was uh, Miriam and studying with them and also their brother. Can't remember his name at the moment. Uh, and then becoming Christians. And I just remember... Sometimes we would go there and the dining table was actually just this little wooden, I don't even remember if it was a table, but I remember the chairs particularly were five gallon buckets, paint buckets. And she invited us over for chicken soup, she said one time, and so uh, many times we were at her house. And chicken soup uh, for her was potatoes boiled and sliced uh, and boiled in a soup and a bouillon cube of chicken blended into the potato soup, and that was chicken soup for Maria. And to me, it just felt, it got to where it just felt normal. I mean, we just didn't, we didn't think anything of it. We, that was just normal business when we visited. We didn't see Maria any different than anybody else. It didn't really dawn on me till we had a group of, of youngsters come from Colorado and we took and Maria needed, uh, uh, we were doing some sort of repairs or putting in a concrete floor, or helping expand the house or something. And we were, we were carrying con uh, buckets of sand and, and gravel up the hill to make concrete. And, um, uh, and when we served, when we, when we had lunch, it was that scenario, sitting around a little wood table on five-gallon buckets and, and whatever it was, and one of them pointed out how, how much Maria didn't have. And I had, I had grown so used to just that's the life when we're at Maria's house, I, I realized that I, I, wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking about that anymore. It just seemed, it seemed normal. But that was, that was her life. Another, another illustration I, I think I've mentioned to you in the past was some, some time after that, our son Daniel is now 36. But when he was 15, uh, he really wanted music. And so we bought him a stereo. This is a stereo. This is, I know a lot of you don't know what that is, but I 
found this online. It said nostalgic stereos. That's pretty much what we bought him was a cassette player. I did not bring an example of what a cassette is. But uh, so, so we bought him one of those. And this machine, uh, we told Daniel we would buy him a, a, a piece of music, a, an album a month, if he would make sure it was Christian-oriented uh, music. And uh, I remember one of the first things he did was he wanted an album by uh, Third Day and another one by the Supertones from Orange County. And uh, so... So, well, let's go check them out. They were having a concert back then. They weren't that popular. So, like five bucks. So, we went to this concert at this church in, in El Cajon with uh, Third Day. And he wanted to sit right on the front row. And these huge speakers just blew us up pra pra practically to the back wall. And so, we said, Daniel, you sit up there. We're going to the back. Uh, but, but I just remember, you know, it wasn't my choice in music styles. It wasn't my choice in music styles. But it spoke to Daniel's heart. It spoke to him. We were becoming adaptable and flexible. Being Jesus to people is being flexible to people. If you're going to serve and love people into loving God, you've got to be like Jesus was. He loved all kinds of people. Poor people, people of different ethnicities, different social statuses and he just loved them because they were people and he was flexible and he didn't make people be flexible to come to him he made himself flexible to his children to, to people who were children or to people who were poor and so we have to learn to be flexible so when you're thinking about God and the gift of love and Jesus coming near to you just remember how flexible Jesus has been to mold himself and demonstrate love to you through how flexible and adaptable he has become and teaches us to be, as a matter of fact, to other people. I think that when we think about this assembly and we get upset about, oh, they're not singing the kind of songs I like. I like the old hymns. I think about Jesus being flexible. One time a, a brother said, you know what? I don't really care if we sing the old hymns or the contemporary ones. Frankly, if I don't like the, the new stuff that the kids want to sing, if that's what they want to sing and that brings them together with the body of Christ, then that's what I want to sing. Because the important thing is getting ourselves into the frame of mind that we can share Jesus with people. The important thing is not getting what makes me feel comfortable. Jesus, being loved to other people, adapted himself to them. So part of church growth and having young families here is being sensitive to what helps them draw near to Jesus. And those of us who have been in the Lord for a number of years saying, you know what, it's not my first choice. It may make me sit back against the wall because it's too loud or whatever. But I want my kids and grandkids here. I'll be flexible. The other thing Jesus loved, not just loving all people, different kinds of people, he loved crowds. I don't really like crowds that much. On Labor Day, when everybody goes over to San Diego, that's the last place I want to be. I don't want to be with gazillions of people on a beach. But when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Jesus was always around people. And he loved being around people. And one of the things that Jesus saw about people was that they were harassed and helpless. I know people are responsible for their own actions and decisions. And I know people need to be taught. But a lot of times, people are placed in circumstances where they have very, very poor leadership. And a lot of information that is available to us has not been in available to them. So many times, people are in situations like Jesus found people in who were just harassed by the religious leaders or fed false information by the religious leaders. And as Jesus, it doesn't, it doesn't mean Jesus uh, condoned their bad choices or their sins or any of that. He just saw them with compassion because they had such poor leadership and opportunities 
false information, people that were self-centered and self-interested around them, uh, not being good leaders. And so Jesus loved crowds of people so he could get among them and teach them and show them, show them the way of the Lord. Jesus loves people. I really like this point. Jesus loves people independent of their productivity. And what I mean by that, independent of productivity, is independent of what people can do for me. You know, in our, uh, in our culture, especially in a small business culture, small business really makes the country work. And when you're a small businessman, you're looking for people who are really productive people because your life, your business depends on people's productivity, including your own, plus the people who work for you. Uh, and so our mindset many times as uh, employers or people who have businesses or uh, people who are trying to uh, make our our economy a little bit better is the people who can help us be productive and who are productive but jesus didn't look at people like that he didn't he didn't he didn't love people based on their productivity based on their ability to make him wealthier or or better uh, economically you remember the story in matthew 20 jesus agreed to pay some he, he went out one morning early in the morning it says and he, and he went out to contract some people to work in his vineyard and uh and and the first group he went out quite early because the second group he went out at nine o'clock and so probably the first group was you know the home depot contractor group like at six in the morning and some people are hanging out there and so he's hiring those folks to work for him at six or six thirty in the morning he goes out again at nine and and hires some more in the second group in verse three it says about nine in the morning he went out and saw they're standing in the marketplace doing nothing and he told them you also go and work in my vineyard and i will pay you whatever is right i think that's a key phrase in the first verse or the second verse it says he agreed to, to pay the first group a denarius which was the common you know a fee for labor for a day those folks he contracted at six or seven by the way they're gonna work till 6 p.m. so this is not the eight-hour American work day okay so this is like six in the morning till 6 p.m. this is a, this is a different culture a different amount of of hours for a work day so so he agrees with those people at the very beginning of Daenerys the ones at, at nine in the morning he says I'll pay you what's right and then you know how the story goes. He hires some more at noon. He hires some more at three. He hires some more at five o'clock. Then at six o'clock, they all get together. He pays the, the, uh, the folks who were there all day long at Denarius. And then he, and he ends up paying everybody else, the ones who came at nine, 12, three, and five. He pays them also a Denarius, the exact same amount. And the first ones get incensed because they say, we thought you would give us more because we bore the sun all day long. These only bore it for one hour. I think the key when he says, isn't it mine to do with what I wish? I think the key is in this phrase right here. He told them, you go out, work in my vineyard. I will pay you whatever is right. Whatever is right according to God, not according to me. See, I judge people on what they can do for me. Jesus judges people on the basis of love. Value on the basis of love. We value people on how or what they can do for us. One of the things this parable teaches is God values people by the fact that they are people. And he has compassion on all people. And his compassion is not merit-based. It's love-based. Another truth that might be added into this mix is if we realize that throughout the Bible, and particularly in Romans, the Bible says all of us have sinned. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. All of us have fallen short of deserving His grace. So then it's not about our merit at all. The very fact that God chooses to save anybody is an, an amazing attitude of love and grace on God's part. 
The very fact that he chooses to e even save uh, anyone by faith is an amazing act of grace. And so there's no merit involved whatsoever. Jesus just loves people because they're people. He loves people because they're created by God, made in his image. His compassion is not merit-based. It's love-based. And finally, another picture of Jesus. And this is the most uh, poignant of all. Jesus loves his enemies. He's been through all of the preparatory phase. He's been beaten by Pilate's soldiers in the courtyard. Uh, his flesh is, is ripped all up. He's so weak he can barely carry, barely carry the cross. Another man, Simon, Serene, is enlisted to carry the cross. They get him up to Golgotha. He's on the cross. One of the gospel writers say, both thieves, each, each one on both sides of him, were insulting him. One will eventually have a, a, a kinder heart, but at the beginning they were insulting him. The soldiers are insulting him. The religious leaders continue to insult him. His disciples have abandoned. They're looking on from a distance, except for maybe one or two around the cross. And when they're killing him, after they've driven the nails into his feet and into his hands, Jesus, where he has this love, who knows, says, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And then they started dividing his clothes among, him, among them as he lay or hung naked on the cross. Where does that kind of love come from? There was a, um, and I don't have the answer to that in myself. <laughs> that is a question that's, that's a difficult question. There was a, uh, during the Vietnam War, I was, it had been going on for a while, but in the 70s, I was in high school. And there was a picture taken by a guy named Nick Ute of this little girl whose name is Kim Fook. A napalm bomb had been dropped. The kids were all huddled up in a temple of, of pagan sorts. It's actually in the, in, the, in the back. You can't see it. It's covered by smoke. But a napalm bomb was dropped. And the reason napalm was used was because it got so hot, it would completely melt the forest and the jungle, and that would allow soldiers to fight and fight, fight against the enemy. The enemy couldn't hide if there was no foliage around, and so they would drop napalm bombs to uh, burn the foliage. But unfortunately, innocent people would get hurt. And so this little girl in the middle of the picture is named Kim Fook. This picture won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for Nick Oot in 1973. It was all over all the magazines back then, uh, and, that, and that was a big, a big thing. But this little girl in the middle is named Kim, and, and so she was, uh, she was practically, about half of her skin was melted off of her body because of that bomb. She has no clothes on because the napalm bomb burned them off. She, and that's why she doesn't have any clothes on. And so Nick took this photo as she was running towards him down the road away from the explosion. Everybody thought she was gonna die. Uh, Nick eventually takes her to a hospital. They left her for dead after a couple of days thinking that she would never survive. Eventually her family found her a few days after being in that hospital and transferred her to a burn center clinic, I believe an American burn center clinic that was operational in uh, Vietnam at the time. And, uh, and she, was, uh, she was saved but not without many scars and the need for many surgeries. She had 17 surgeries uh, following that incident 